presentation. It's going to be a very, very good topic, very timely topic. Um, help yourself to the refreshments. Um, so, um, the inducement to get you here, uh, but also to get you to listen and ask questions after the presentation is, is at the end. Before I, I introduce our speaker this afternoon, I'd like to give some shout outs to people who helped me uh, put this together. In particular, uh, Adam uh, and John from Palm Services. Uh, the committee who selected uh, the uh, presenters this year. Dr. Del Pardo, Dr. Stone, Dr. Varela, Dr. Wagner, and Dr. Zhang. Um, so that's so, shout out for the, the, the refreshments uh, and the coffee to keep you awake. No, you don't need coffee to keep you awake today. It's gonna be a good coffee. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of people that put this together and certainly Academic Affairs, Melissa uh, helps uh, organize this, and Dr. Renz uh, supports this lecture series um, for uh, students, faculty, staff, and the public. This afternoon, Dr. Zach Mitchell is going to present um, his research, and the title is Dry Rivers, Responses of Fish and Isolated Ponds During Reduced Stream Flow. Obviously a very timely subject uh, as we're dealing with uh, reduced water and, and drought. His synopsis, New Mexico is highly susceptible to drought and excessive water extraction. It is important to understand the impacts of stream drying on aquatic communities. Our project is designed to better understand the relative importance of various abiotic and biotic factors in determining fish survival in isolated pools during periods of reduced stream flows in the Pecos River, New Mexico. Obviously, we need to understand the effects of drought and support measures that mitigate drought's impacts on aquatic communities. Please help me welcome Dr. Zach Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Apparently, this talk is a lot more interesting than when I talk about freshwater mussels in the spring. It's <laughs> you know, the number of people here, so that's good. And, i uh, talk about a topic today that is very familiar to everyone that's from New Mexico or from the Southwest or has spent any amount of time here. Seeing dry riverbeds is a common occurrence and it's something that we're used to. Uh, and something that's predicted to get even worse, which is a problem for species that require water. All right. And so this is a picture of a section of the middle Rio Grande River. Uh, this is not where the projects take place. The project talk about today on the Pecos, but it kind of highlights this section uh, regularly goes dry. There's an intense amount of effort to try to remove certain species such as the Rio Grande Silvery Minnow, fairly native species from these isolated pools, which is an extremely costly endeavor and perhaps maybe not the best use of resources to protect fish and each community. Before I start talking about a couple of ongoing projects, I want to highlight some student researchers that were involved with these two projects and received funding from the two grants that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Brittany's sitting over here. She's a master student of mine. She'll be involved in the second project that I talk about, which is still ongoing. We're maybe halfway through. Uh, and then Jody, Lee, and Josh. Uh, undergrad students that were technicians this summer that worked on this first part of the field service and more of the intensive stuff. And so that project just kind of finished. Uh, so I'm just trying, starting to get to report writing, some data analysis. So any results I talk about today for both, very brief, uh, nothing real heavy, so it should be pretty light. Just kind of want to show the work that our students are doing. Uh, I've had additional students help with other projects this summer, but don't have time to talk about that. So if you look on any news media outlet, uh, a lot of peer-reviewed literature, headlines such as these are very common nowadays, particularly in New Mexico and the Southwest, talking about the current mega drought, the aridification of the Southwest, uh, all the issues related to the social issues, economic, agriculture sectors, in addition to ecological consequences. Having these increasing severity of drought and frequency of drought events. 
And so it's something we're very familiar with. And even here in Port Tavis, we've been on water restrictions for several months now. Uh, and so far, it doesn't seem to be making a whole lot of progress. It is not very easy to just generate massive amounts of water whenever we wish. You know, there's a lot of states in the Southwest that have been working on these giant pipeline projects, even trying to pipe water from the Great Lakes all the way up to California, for example. All right, because we realize it's an issue of having lower water quantity, at least during certain times of the year. And so typically when you talk about climate change, you're thinking of something way really far in advance. But this is an issue that we're already dealing with now, and people in the Southwest are a little bit more aware of it because they're dealing with issues of decreased water availability. So everyone in here, if I ask you what drought is, you get a picture of what drought is. But typically, it can be difficult to define what a drought is. What specific metrics can we use to quantify drought intensity, for example? And there's well over, and it's probably over 200 now, published definitions of a drought. There's different types of drought. We do ecological, hydrological, meteorological, economic drought, so on and so forth. And they are a myriad of metrics used to estimate the intensity of drought. All right, so for our purposes, though, a general definition that we'll go by is we're thinking of deficiency in precipitation over extended period. This can be a seasonal or super seasonal pattern that reduces water availability. In the case of stream ecology, we're going to talk about today, we can think of reduced stream flows within the riverbed, reduced groundwater recharge rates, reduced soil, soil moisture levels, we can think of reduced snowpack levels. Is very impactful throughout the southwest. So we can think of just less water, less moisture. Now we know what is a mega drought. We're just thinking of multi decadal <coughs> pattern of that deficit in water. All right. A paper by Williams et al. published, I believe, in Nature Climate Change last year looked at the past two decades and kind of related it to some of the more drier events uh, using some dead river technology and said that headline of this is the driest it's been in 1200 years this is what this is what paper this is based on that was new articles art. and this blue line you know we haven't it's still short-lived but it's expected to at least keep lasting for the next five to ten years and probably longer some of the projections depending upon the different models they use we could be in this mega drought for at least a couple more decades and so the negative impacts that drought events have on river systems, but all the other negative impacts it can have, uh, will likely intensify over time. If we look at New Mexico over the past 20 years, different colors represent from abnormally dry as we get darker to exceptional drought. We can see over the past 20 years, we see that evidence of that mega drought where the majority of the state is at least at some point abnormally dry. And at the very end of 2020, we see that pretty much the entire the entire state is in drought conditions. And so if we break these down from abnormally dry to exceptional, I just want to highlight a couple of numbers. One, almost 80% is classified as being in a severe drought. 99.6% as abnormally dry, and then we're around a little over 40, 45% of extreme drought or exceptional drought. When we talk about large economic losses, uh, more impacts to human health, uh, massive loss of biodiversity potential, is when we're out here. So we have a very high percentage of New Mexico classified in these droughts currently right now. We can map out those values throughout the state, and these values change, this I think is a, a, a weekly measure. And we can see that the Pecos River, which we're going to talk about on this eastern side, is a real hot spot of exceptional drought down in the southeastern part of the state. Not only that, we have a lot of other stressors that impact the Pecos River uh, throughout this region. And so if we're thinking about drought intensity impacts of river systems, this Pecos River is a really good model system to focus on. We're likely going to see more dramatic effects compared to maybe other river systems. So it looks pretty bad now. 
and it's predicted to continually get worse. And so over the past two decades, especially in the eastern and southeastern, when we have the Upper Pecos River, compared to long-term averages, we have quite high temperature increases. This is expected to continue at this rate or potentially get worse depending upon emission levels over the next 50 to 100 years. Again, picking up intensifying. So it doesn't, it looks relatively bleak. And so when I talk about water management later on, it's an issue that you need to start on now. Because even if you change now, there's a significant temporal lag in which to really catch up. Things aren't just going to change instantly. Predicted over time, EPA models, typically we see a lot of red, so this up to a negative 40% change in snow water equivalent throughout all of the southwest and all our northern mountain ranges that feed the Pecos River. Reduced runoff in the spring and summer and decreased soil moisture. Soil moisture. All right, and again, this is going all the way, I think, till 2070. And this is under a high emission scenario, which given our current track, we're probably gonna be in that scenario realistically. If we start taking away moisture at large scales for several decades, we start to see increased stream drying at large scales. And so a recent article a few years ago in Nature was talking about comparing rivers to this uncertain future, because we have rivers that are now disappearing at least at a seasonal basis. Now, there's a lot of intermittent ephemeral streams globally. They make up the majority of rivers. So perennial rivers are already a minority, and it seems to be kind of moving forward. So this is a picture of the river in Spain. Again, that fish had been stranded due to drought, and ultimately just kind of died off. So ideally, our river systems, perennial systems, we might look something like this on the left. There's water flowing through from headwaters all the way downstream. So we have complete longitudinal connectivity. Individual aquatic organisms can move up and down as they need to to meet their general life history needs. As we increase in drought severity, likely we can lose longitudinal connectivity in that tan area, so that's no water is flowing. If this continues, we start to have formations of these isolated pools. All right, so if, if any organism happens to get caught in there, if they can't survive the biotic and abiotic stresses that I'll talk about on the next slide, they're likely going to die before the water is reconnected. So an example of what we see commonly in a lot of streams here in New Mexico, we will have flowing full longitudinal connectivity during certain seasons, we think of summer, periods of low precipitation, increased drought, we will lose that connectivity. You can see this is kind of an isolated pool here. And so if you don't have the ability to escape that, you might get stranded there. And then you're waiting for a hopeful for re-wetting, or you might completely dry out if you don't have the ability to survive that. Like many of our fish that we'll talk about will die. Right, so this is something that's very common in a lot of areas, particularly in the Southwest. If we look at the specific issues that organisms deal with, this looks at fish and macroinvertebrates. Uh, we collect macroinvertebrates for these projects, but for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of focus on the fish. We have time here, so we can lose longitudinal connectivity in the river all the way to a complete loss of surface water. So the pool we think is totally dried up. So over time, we're losing the number of species and the number of individuals over time as conditions become more harsh. So in the beginning, we might have connection with groundwater that can help uh, keep temperatures cooler for water, which can increase survival times. Over time, though, we might lose some thermally sensitive species. These are species that can't handle increased water temperatures. So they could die off. Eventually, if it keeps persisting, we can only have these extreme individuals, individual species that can handle very high water temperatures, low levels of dissolved oxygen, 
you know, very little food type spaces, you know, very few species are really going to fall under that category here in New Mexico. Also, besides dealing with those abiotic, the increased water temperatures, lower dissolved oxygen, fish are now potentially having to compete with one another for limited space, limited resources within those pools. We also have biotic interaction in terms of predation that I'll talk about more later on. If you're isolated in a little pool, it's much easier for uh, a heron or a raccoon to come up and grab you and eat you because you have nowhere to go. Or you could get trapped with a much larger predator fish and it can just eat you because you have nowhere to hide potentially. And so it's these biotic and abiotic factors, those stressors that really intensify uh, when they get strained in these isolated pools. And then unless you're safe, a rainstorm, eventually you're going to dry out, and for a lot of organisms, for fish, you will die and survive. Now, potentially a lot of insects, crayfish, we might be able to burrow down to get to that hyperion groundwater connection and survive, uh, but it's much harder for you know, fish to make it through these extreme events. So the projects I'm going to talk about today, just a few general questions that we thought of way in the beginning before we wrote some of these uh, proposals, is how common are isolated pool formations in the Pecos? So where are they formed? How many are they formed? What species are primarily stranded in pools? Uh, there's some evidence that suggests that it may impact native versus non-native species differentially. And then, are abiotic or biotic stressors more important at dictating fish survival rates in isolated pools? Abiotic, we think of changes in water temperature, dissolved oxygen levels. Biotic, we can think of competition, or in this case, we're going to focus on predation for our second study. Which is more important over time? So, the first two objectives are related to the field surveys I'll talk about. Uh, we're going to look at the spatial and temporal variation of isolated pools. So under a stretch of Pecos River that I'll show you, when and how often are these isolated pools formed, what's inside of those pools, and, and do they survive or not? How long can they survive? The third objective is examining the importance of those abiotic versus biotic variables influencing fish survival across different seasons using the visa problem experiment outside of Pecos River. So this one is just really kind of getting started. So we're going to brief overview of all. If you're unfamiliar with the Pecos River, it is a large tributary of Rio Grande originating up in the San Jose Cristo mountain range, flowing south. Uh, Fort Sumner is where this work will take place, about a little over an hour away from here, flowing south until it reaches the Rio Grande confluence. And this is a highly disturbed riverscape. There are several major dams. There are issues with oil and gas development, a lot of heavy agriculture use, a lot of heavy irrigation use. If you'd like to study disturbances on any aspect of life, the Pecos River is a great model system. If you're interested in a little bit of a, kind of more history and background of the Pecos River, I'm almost done reading this book, Clear Waters. Uh, it's really interesting, and it talks all the way back from the very first kind of surveys of the Spaniards coming up and kind of describing them, the area formally, all the way up to, you know, its current issues. So I recommend reading that. It's kind of interesting, and, you know, it's not scientific at all, so if you don't like to read peer-reviewed journal literature, welcome to read this. All right, so this is our study site, an aerial image of our study site on the Busque Redondo Park, just south of Fort Sumner. Uh, so this is open to the public. You can drive out there, and a lot of people use this. You can tell by all the roadways on the landscape. This is about a, a mile of river. And so this is the upstream segment downstream. What we would do, my uh, undergrad students and I would go out there. We plan on going every week, once a week walking this whole stretch of river, and then identifying every isolated pool that we found, marking it and taking a variety of environmental variables and sampling fish, insects, and crayfish within each pool and nearby frame. So rather field intensive. So as we were walking down the river, 
you might come across this isolated pool right here. You can see there's lost connection to the perennial area that's still flowing. And so we take GPS points, go up to the pool, and start to record a variety of data. We took estimates of size, so pool length, pool width, water depth, uh, distance to the perennial riverside, uh, a variety of water quality parameters such as temperature, dissolved oxygen, these, these sorts of things. Can it be covered? So a suite of environmental and spatial variables. So here's Lee, for example, on one of our deeper isolated pools uh, that was the only pool this summer that retained water. Uh, estimating depth and has a wide side for some water quality measurements. After that, we use same nets, uh, multiple runs through each pool to collect fish, and we also get a lot of great fish with this method as well. Once we did that, put them in buckets, we would identify, count, and measure the total length of all species, and then we would return them to that pool. So we're not saving them, we're just putting them right back in the pool, because if the pool lasts, we want to see changes in relative abundance over time and species composition. So the next several slides I'm going to just walk you through every time we went out so you can see the spatial and temporal trends of how pools were formed. So we won't go super in-depth, but you can just get an idea of how it fluctuates. But we're going to look at this relationship with discharge. So this is a hydrograph. So a hydrograph shows the volume of water in cubic feet per second over time. And you can see that this is a highly regulated flow regime. So the base flows are regulated by the Sumner Dam. Um, they are supposed to maintain a minimum of 100 CFS. If I can tell you, that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, that's, the, that's the minimum. Uh, thought to not have to be able to kill everything, but it's not mentioned met a lot. And then we see we have a couple large peaks. Now, typically above 400 CFS, it's not really safe to go out there uh, in the field, and especially sanding, it's not very efficient to actually catch all the fish. Right, so that, that's what it is. I've also cropped some of the image because the highest and lowest extent we've never found any isolated pool. So I'm just kind of zooming in. So the very first week represented by this vertical dashed line, the number above that vertical dashed line represents the number of newly formed pools during that survey here. So we have three blue circles. Those are where those pools were located. Uh, the GPS we use is accurate to about a meter so we can get you know, pretty accurate details. I will say this is the same as dominated river. So what it looked like this summer is not very, it doesn't look like what this image is because this is an older Google Earth image. So if it looks kind of confusing, that's potentially more. So we started with three pools. A couple weeks before this, it's been relatively low base flows, no big recent rains. So I wouldn't expect a lot of the lateral river channel to have been flooded out and potentially to trap water. We went out about a week later where you see this red X, and you can see what happens on that red X. We have a giant increase. So this was before I knew that there was a call list uh, to let you know that they're about to release air water from the dam. And so we are out the evening before setting crayfish traps. The next morning we're going to go sample all these isolated pools. While setting up my tent, I start to hear some noise, and I think that deer are crossing the river just upstream. And then I visibly can see the water rising. And so I'm used to working in flashy river systems, so of course you can pack it up then. And uh, this is where the left where we were at on the bank. And minutes later, uh, the area is completely flooded. And this was before it ever got near that top peak. And so this whole area would be flooded. All this land on both sides would be completely covered. Uh, Typically, block releases last for around 15 days, and so we basically had to wait a little over two weeks of that sustained high flow that we saw in the hydrograph before we go back down. This is a little downstream. We saw a lake sampling in this isolated pool. This is looking upstream. That pool is supposed to be right here. And so it's completely covered, and this was still early on. You can actually see, if you notice, there's a side-by-side -side right there. I guess guys lived on the other side of the river were driving around got caught, 
and they were about to try to drive across this. Luckily, they didn't because they for sure, there's a deep hole right where they were at. I don't think they knew that. They, they definitely would have got washed downstream. And so, remember, if you're in Texas, you see all the turnaround of the ground signs. So, very relevant. But luckily, nothing happened. But we just all right, so now we're back next month, a few weeks later, and we have shortly after the water went back down to base flow levels. We found 13 pools kind of scattered, you know, throughout this section. All right. and typically where we have more channel complexity, more meandering, more of these sandbars, more side channels, that's where we're going to see these pools form. All of this was underwater during that day release. We go one week later though, we notice almost the majority of those pools, they dried out in less than a week. So anything that was in there died in terms of fish. We're getting a couple more as we're getting a little bit lower. You, know, you might lose six inches of water slowly, you know, uncovering a couple more pools. And we finally have a few pools that made it through from the last week. Right, so potentially we still have fish that are living within those pools. The next couple of weeks, not much changed and very no single one. Single one. Two pools this time. And we notice that there's this one pool here. That's the one that we saw earlier with flea sampling. And it, that's the only pool all summer in that maintained water. No other pool did for the entire period. And the majority is less than a week probably. Finally, right before the next game release, of which I was now on the call list, so I knew it was happening, <laughs> we found no new pools. All right, so then we wait for the call list. I feel bad for the guy. He has to call close to 100 people. I was thinking an automated email list or something like that might be a little better. Because he was reluctant to add me on it because he already had to make several days worth of phone calls. But I got on it, so we got out there right before it hit. And so we try it every week, but you know, there's a little, little mishap, but that always happens in ecology fields. So we went out uh, on Labor Day weekend. I drug my fiance and dog out there to help me sample fish. So I put her to work. And it was a lot of work because we found 20 pools because we went right after it dropped down to base four. So I expect this where we sample 12. You're a few days after, I imagine there was more pools, but they had already dried up the smaller ones relatively fast. So we had 20 pools, again, spread out through this area, and again, in areas where we see these kind of more side channels, more channel complexity. And in the final week, uh, we had three of those. The other 17 had dried less than that week later. So all fish that were in those pools died. And then this was the last time, so I haven't gone out. This is just one season. I'm hoping to continue this in this area and potentially expand. Uh, right, working on a great proposal right now to really scale this project up. So hopefully, I think that might be interesting to get several seasons of data. And so very brief results because I won't bore you with any statistics. And I'm just honestly getting into it myself. Within the isolated pools, we collect about 16 species, which is about half or a little over half of the species you might expect in terms of fish diversity in that section of the Pecos River. Red shiner here and the evasive common carp here were the most abundant. We found a ton of them at the majority of pools every single week. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but we caught several thousand fish in isolated pools over the summer. And then some other ones, you have the big scale walk perch, white crappie sand shiner, our mosquito fish, that's one of the more extremal file fishes in the Pecos River that can handle those intense water temperatures. And then we have our plains chili fish. So those are just some of the examples. We caught a lot of like the more water game fish like bluegill, channel catfish that you might expect. Um, and so one thing that I did we did notice is full permanence for the majority of them is less than a week. You can see the pool. By the time we got back there, it had already dried, and we would either, like I, I'll show, see tracks of predation, evidence of predation, or just dried up fish on the ground. 
And we notice the pools are primarily created anthropogenically. Most of the pools are created after those block releases. And so those are for irrigation purposes. All right. And we know that since block releases, they're so spread out, they're not very frequent. They don't, they don't in, imitate a natural flow regime. There's no chance for those isolated pools to become reconnected, particularly in the summer when you might only have a few days. And so it's almost guaranteed mortality, which could be an issue if you think of some of the more threatened and endangered species that live in this region. So based on those observations of seeing the animal tracks on the dry pools and wondering about the influence of biotic versus abiotic factors, we developed this mesocosm study that Brittany is working on in order to try to look at is it abiotic or biotic influences that are more important in determining fish survival rate in isolated pools. And we want to look, does it change over season? Abiotic might be more important in the summer. We think biotic predation might be more important in the fall, relatively. So that's kind of the question that we're going through here. And so this is one of the larger isolated pools that we found during the summer. This, although large, dried up in less than a week, uh, because it's, it's a little higher, so there's really no a hyperedic connection. It's a little kind of farther off on the side chain. And if you get look a little closer here, it's very common to see all these dry pools, to see a lot of tracks, a lot of heron, and a lot of raccoon tracks in these pools. And so since we're not out there continuously, we might actually see it drying. Uh, we wonder, did the fish die prior to them being eaten by the predators, so abiotic control? Or did the water get low enough that the predators came in and ate them while they were still alive? So which one is kind of more important? They both matter, obviously, to some degree, but we might focus importance on managing one versus the other. And so we made predictions visualized here of what we think the relative importance is for our biotic versus abiotic factors. So we have abiotic control in this gray line that you can't really see on this. TV kind of does this. So I think of abiotic control, we're thinking of increased water temperature, decreased dissolved oxygen, increased ammonia levels potentially over winter through the fall. And then biotic control, the black dashed line, for biotic control, we're focusing on predation in this case. Okay, so we're kind of controlling for others, we're just looking at predation from terrestrial and avian predators. We predict in both the winter and summer that abiotic control will have a, a more important role than biotic control. There's a lot of studies out there looking at we have isolated pools. Yes, it's not hot, but the pools can freeze and kill the fish, especially their smaller pools. We might have decreased animal predator activity during the winter. As we start to warm up, spring, more animal movement, we might expect more predators to occur in a given area, so more predation. Although abiotic conditions are, you know, it's not real hot, it's not freezing, so it might not be as important. Summer, it gets extremely hot. As we saw during the field observations, these pools dry up very quickly, oftentimes. So we're thinking that that high increase in water temperature is going to drive dissolved oxygen levels down and kill off the fish relatively pretty quickly before we might see predators, and we're thinking predators, we might just be more nocturnal during the season. And then, similar to spring, we think fall, we'll see more predator feeding, predator units. So that's kind of our predictions for this. So we're conducting this mesocosm experiment four times. So this is kind of a conceptual diagram of what the project looks like. I have some real photos so you can actually understand what I'm talking about. These blue circles, we have 20 of them, are our pools. So these are actual just kitty pools that we bought and we painted. And so we have 10 large pools and 10 small pools. The small pools are, can hold about half the volume of water as our large pools. So we want to look at impacts of pool size, like we saw differences in the field surveys. The pools with these lines, so half of them are covered. This is covered in chicken wire. This is to keep predators out from reaching the fish. So we put 10 red shiner in each individual pool. Red shiner is a very common species in all the pools that we found this summer and easily caught at this field site. So we buried these pools in a random order, half of them covered, 
to keep predators away, pass them open. This way we can track survival over time, in this case five days for each trial, to see whether abiotic or biotic factors are more important to dictating survival rates. We put temperature loggers in a subset of these and took regular water quality measurements. These little rectangles represent game cameras that we had set up on the pools so we could hopefully see what type of predators are in the area, and if there's an actual predation event, we'll hopefully catch it on camera. So here's a couple photos of getting kind of early on getting set up, of laying them out, and then we bury them a little bit more to kind of be flush with the sand in a randomized order, and then putting uh, the, the chicken wire on half of them, so five of the small, five of the large. Then we have staked out the game cameras, so you can see the flowing room back here. Within the pool, we put some rocks. Some of these had temperature loggers hidden underneath them, and just kind of give the fish some cover uh, to swim around. We have some chicken wire on one, and then you can see the red shiner swimming around with no predator protection. We did catch some critters on camera. Uh, not always the best the first time we did this in the spring. I'll talk about it. We had limited days, but we're also trying to get something a little more sturdy because the wind was kind of really knocking our cameras around. Uh, so we raccoons, we picture deer, turkeys, I believe this is a kid fox. Uh, we found some toads in the pools. So we're getting some, we're getting some critters. Uh, I haven't gone through all of the camera pictures yet, so probably more I described a couple. So our first trial was in for our spring trial. We went out, spent hours <laughs> digging up gravel to bury these pools. And of course, by the second day, there was a massive storm that flooded our site out. <laughs> uh, so we started getting rain the afternoon before. We got a little video on the camera. You can see the water's already risen, but Based on how high the sandbar is, if it stayed below 500 CFS, we would be safe. It wouldn't flood. It had peaked, stopped raining overnight, but I think it was like 4 or 5 in the morning. A random storm popped up and dropped a lot of water, and uh, CFS jumped to over a thousand. And so we had basically our site completely flooded almost. So we're going from here. You can see where we lose a lot of pools. This was around. So you can kind of see a heron walking around during the high floods. So we lost some equipment uh, after this ordeal. And so our first spring trial was only about two days a day if we didn't get the full five. We did get a full five this summer in August. And next week we'll be out there setting up for the fall. Over break we'll be doing the winter trial. And I think we're going to do another spring trial again since this one kind of got launched. But hopefully we don't have <laughs> Surprise storms again, but we probably will. That's how we're going. And then, not long after, we see the water recedes. So again, pretty flashy uh, system because it's so heavily controlled from those dam operations. So very brief. We did have during those first two days extremely high survival. We only lost one fish. All right, so that was good. We did have higher predator occurrences. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but we had uh, higher diversity of pictures being taken and higher counts. And anecdotally noticed increased kind of tracks in the area, but we can't really quantify that, so I won't put much weight on those things. During the summer, we had vastly different outcomes. Extremely low survival rates, only 21% total. This is combining predator, non-predator, small and large. Um, I think the pools that didn't have predator protection had higher rates of mortality. However, there was so much variation statistically, there's really no difference. And so really, we think abiotic hit hard, especially if the pool completely dried out and it just got some um, fish in its left. And then fewer predators, and again, commonly pictured at uh, and so, so far, although we're just kind of getting started, potential to kind of follow along our predictions that we would expect based on some other previous studies as well. And so, some main takeaways that I hope to kind of expand to future projects, uh, to expand these projects continuum, but also add some new components that try to address more of the 
complexities, since these are relatively simple approaches so far, is that we know New Mexico is predicted it's going to get hotter and drier. All right, so the occurrences of these drought events, pool isolation, is probably going to continue to increase. And we only looked at a mile. Imagine, you know, there's four major dams on the Pecos that do these sort of block releases and a lot of smaller ones. Imagine the amount of isolation that occurs on those rivers. You know, I'm sure it's very similar to the Rio Grande. Uh, they care more about that because of the silvery minnow being federally endangered, uh, but you know, there's not enough manpower to go and rescue all these fish. And so we can imagine thousands of fish we lost here, probably a lot you know, worse. Isolated pools are common, and again, most fish are not rescued. There's no chance of rescue due to the way we practice our water movements for our irrigation practices. So this is the hydrograph that we looked at on several slides of this summer. We have two bulk releases, each lasting about 15 days, a very high discharge. When we flood this area, fish are going to move out of the way of the intense flow off to these side habitats. The issue really happens in the stranding is how fast this water drops back down. You know, if you're not a large body fish that has the ability to quickly move, you're probably going to get stranded. And so these are all kind of little smaller body individuals. If you don't have another rain event or dam release in the near future, you're guaranteed to die, either through predation or just abiotic stress. Over here is something we might expect, something a little more natural. So four dams. We might have shorter duration flows, but they're closer together. So if they were stranded here, they might get rescued if there's another flood, minor pulse event a few days later. All right, there's chances for rescue. There's no chance for rescue here, especially during the summer when we saw that pools do not last very long, the majority. So far, abiotic factors seem to be uh, the most important, although I'd like to do a lot more work with the biotic stuff, not just looking at predation, but also competition as well. Uh, doing some lab stuff here, a little more controlled settings, and also some field uh, experiments. So I'm still thinking about those ideas. But we see a seasonal variation intensity. You know, those abiotic factors are going to be as stressful you know, compared to the spring, compared to the summer. Even though we have those two days of data, if we just look at the first two days during the summer, we still had much higher mortality rates than the two days in the spring, which we just lost in the point fish. Of course, I need more funding to continue asking these interesting questions, uh, trying to assess you know, how can we differentiate the importance of these different factors over the space and time. Ultimately, we need a better understanding of flow ecology relationships and management practices. So there's a lot of work in environmental flows of how can we maybe mimic dam releases to match natural flow regimes to not only ensure you know ecological resilience but also still meet the practical needs because we need crops still. All right, so I think there's some no side is going to win outright, but there's some middle ground that we can definitely improve upon in my opinion. In Mexico. There's a lot of states that other countries that are making good strides. There's a lot of good case examples. Australia, for example. So a question for final thought for you that I ask all my students in every class, I ask them where their water comes from. And I'm surprised of how many people do not know where their water comes from when they turn on the faucet or take a shower. So if you don't know where your water comes from, I challenge you to find out and look that up and start to think about how you use water at a personal level, and then think of how that might impact the region as a whole, particularly in the Southwest, where we need to be conscious about water use and water management. Because, although New Mexico's fifth largest state, we have the lowest amount of surface water out of all the other states. And with that, I'd like to thank the New Mexico Water Resource Research Institute. These projects were funded on two separate grants, the faculty and the student research training programs. Other members of my lab here at Eastern and Eastern New Mexico University, of course, existing space and equipment. And with that, I'll take any questions. 
That's my dog, Roscoe, <laughs> helping collect fish on the Pecos River. Are you sure you wasn't eating them? What's that? Are you sure you just wasn't eating them? Nah, he's too slow to catch them. <laughs> so, what determines when they release the water from the dams? But yeah, so I'm still not 100% clear on that. So, uh, the Fort Sumner Dam, Santa Rosa, it's all operated by the Carlsbad Irrigation District. When they say they need a certain amount of feet per feet for water, they tell them. And it's just kind of, it's based on how much precipitation they've gotten, moisture levels down there. I'm not sure all their metrics of when they ask for it. We also have to give a certain amount of water, I can't remember the value, to Texas every year. Uh, due to some you know, compact, we owe them a lot of water from the Davis. So it's very cool, but typically there's one to four water releases a year. This year there was two. It wasn't a real water. Why not just have a constant uh, higher release of water? A constant higher release of water? Higher release of water. Not like the highest, but a uh, higher weight than what we see in that global. And so we, we start to step on toes. Uh, we try to get that, that minimum of 100 CFS. I'm not exactly sure how it was determined. Uh, but well, we, you, like, but you don't really get that. but. You start to take away the storage capacity of these reservoirs. They're meant to be storing water. If you're just pushing it down, if you get hit hard, you might not have enough in storage. So a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you attended, um, they had a documentary on campus about the sink gas, which seems to be a different type of, not as extreme as a block release of water. Um, did you get to see that? I, I did not. Okay, we have a copy here and it's streaming on PBS. I would be interested in understanding how that type of system of releasing water for irrigation, which does not seem to be as disruptive as a block release, might. Because it's something that the documentary takes it from a, um, a cultural and ecological viewpoint, not, they're not looking at fish. Yeah. Unfortunately, but I think it would be interesting to look at that. And we, we have the filmmaker left a copy here, so yeah. yeah thank you. I, I think when I was, I was talking to the dam operator at Fort Sumner, you know, they do 15 days of extremely high flow, so it has a lot of other issues with erosion, like control, and you know, there, there's other issues besides just stranding fish that you take into account. Oftentimes, so they don't, they're not using the water immediately. They store it in some reservoirs down there and then use it at a later date. And if they're doing that, why can't we at least just have intermittent every two or three days release some water? If they're not going to use it immediately, you could spread it out. So at least in the beginning until the last one, uh, if fish are stranded, there's the potential to be less. And you could potentially maybe do it not at full bore 1600 CFS and knock it down a little bit. Or the, uh, another good thing would be instead of just closing it and dropping the discharge rapidly, doing more gradual decrease, and fish are more able to, if it's a slower decline, to follow it back into the brain side. Uh, we see this issue not just block releases, but uh, so hydro peaking, so downstream of hydro and electric dams. Completely the same issue for a lot of Sort of interference that you had in any from the humans. Uh, that spot that you had the, the pools on is pretty open access, it's public. Yeah, and lots of times the gate was driving it. So, so where we had the pools are at the Bosco Redondo Park, uh, it's a few miles south at the Billy the Kid. Um, oh, okay. I'm not sure what that is. They have a museum, and I can't remember what the whole thing's called, but we actually got permission there. and. They're closed, I think, like two or three days of the week. So one, we use most days where people aren't there. Okay. They do have a little river trail you can walk, but access to the actual river is fenced off. And so besides Brittany going out there to take measurements, uh, no evidence to suggest anyone else is there. But yeah, then at the other site where we did the field surveys, there are people and they're there all the time. And also, I wondered if it's better or not better to have a sign saying research in progress, please not, not disturb. Whether that's a magnet for people to disturb. I think that's a magnet to disturb based on my experiences in the past. <laughs> if they know something's there, they'll probably mess with it. Right. 
I'm sure we missed taxa over time, but I was trying to control for us just ruining every pool each week and increasing stress on the suspicion pools and we're probably